Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am obviously Liv, here with part three of Euripides' Ion, a play I have become obsessed with in a truly overwhelming way. How did no one ever tell me that it was like this feminist, like this anti-patriarchy? How how did it take me seven years of the podcast to finally read it? Truly, this is the joy of the ancient world and and a playwright like Euripides. Like every time you think you've seen it all, there is something else just ready to blow it all out of the water. And well, like we're only a third of the way <laughs> through the play, so let's get right back in. Where we last left our characters, Creusa, a princess of Athens, was visiting the Delphic Oracle with her husband, Xuthus. They are childless and seeking answers, though what Xuthus doesn't know is that Creusa did bear a child before they ever met. She was raped by the god Apollo, and this is your warning that this topic will remain a major part of the play, though in a truly revolutionary way. And she tried to expose the child that was born of the assault in the same place where it happened. When she went back, though, after she found the baby gone without a trace. This is because Apollo had the baby carried off to Delphi, where he was raised as a temple attendant and has just interacted with Creusa. They spoke of their shared story, or rather, Creusa says it happened to a friend of hers and that she's seeking news of the baby, whether it still lives, seeking this news from the god. She won't be getting a prophecy from Apollo, though, and she has kept it all from her husband. Meanwhile, Xuthus went to seek the oracle's prophecy about his own childlessness and walked out of that temple with the newfound idea that not only was this temple attendant, Ion, his son, but also that he possessed the boy because of it. Euripides in this play is examining women's traumas and how they are seen in this world, and how mothers and fathers handle having children, again, in this world. Creusa wants to love a child, and Xuthus wants to possess the things that come with having an heir. Ion is in between, acting as a kind of genderless mediator. He wasn't socialized with other children, and so lacked these like defined gender roles. I don't mean to suggest that he doesn't have a gender, but his lack of the societal roles for either a boy or a girl in ancient Athens or ancient Greece is, I think, meant to serve as this kind of blank slate on which Euripides can present mostly women's characters as they compare to men's. And I am fucking here for it. This is episode 262, For Love or Possession, Defining Ancient Parenthood, Euripides' is Ion, Part 3. Ion has just been told that this strange man standing before him is, in fact, his father. He isn't excited. Whether it's because of Kasuthis' behavior, that he refused to answer any pertinent questions or even really examine how or why he's being told that this boy is his son, or because he seems only interested in the act of possessing a child rather than, like, parenting a child. You know, it isn't clear. But Ion is clearly wary of Xuthus and mostly uninterested in this information. Ion has grown up amongst the temple and its caretakers. He hasn't had a childhood or parents that he knew of, or really anything except this devotion to Apollo that came with his life. He works for the god, he worships the god, and loves the god like a father. Of course, what he doesn't know is that Apollo is, indeed, his biological father. But Ion has been told by Creusa of this crime, by Apollo, this violation of a woman's body and how it resulted in a child. He's horrified at the accusation, and remember, he deliberately called out not only Apollo for this violence, but the gods more broadly. Ion called out the predatory nature of the gods, how they set rules for humanity but violate those same rules themselves. 
Euripides, through Ion, seems to be taking a close look at the actions of the gods and forming a judgment. Ion is questioning his love for the god, is questioning the behavior of the gods broadly and specifically, how they've forced themselves on so many women, have fathered so many half-mortal children, and what that says about not only the gods, but the women they victimize. This play is truly, really looking at the culture of divine rape in ancient Greek mythos, and finally, finally, calling it for what it is. Trauma. These women are finally allowed to experience it as trauma and have those around them acknowledge it. Ion follows up this revelation that apparently Xuthus is his father by instead thinking of his mother. He wonders where she is, who she is, since Xuthus seems unconcerned with recalling whoever he might have impregnated. It's notable, too, that it isn't Xuthus who responds to Ion's prayer to his mother, but the chorus of women. The women are, you remember, attendants to Creusa. They are enslaved, but here they are presented as caring for her. They are happy enough that Xuthus has been told he has a son, but they wish it was their mistress, Creusa who was able to have a child. They, like Creusa, are interested in the love parents have for their children, of the way that love impacts their life. Kasuthis, though, remains pretty fucking clueless. He is obsessed with the idea that Ion should be as excited as he is. He tells Ion, quote, The god has done us a service and joined you to me, and you, in turn, have found what is dearest to you that you did not know before. As almost an afterthought, he adds that, oh, actually, he also wants to know who Ion's mother is. Like, he hopes the boy finds her, quote, and I will know what sort of woman gave you birth. Because again, Xuthus seems pretty disinterested in his role in the whole thing. He doesn't note that such a woman must have been impregnated by him in order for Apollo's prophecy to make sense as he's heard it. Only what kind of woman has provided him with what he wanted an heir, a son to possess. He tells Ion plainly, quote, leave the gods' foundations and your homelessness. Come to Athens, sharing your father's way of thinking. Then he seems to, arguably for the first time, actually interpret Ion's body language. He asks if Ion is silent, and why does he look so worried? I'll explain, Ion says. He agrees he's happy to have found his father. He does think he's lucky, but he's worried about going to Athens. He knows enough about the city to know that he, as the son of a foreign father, because remember, Xuthus is not Athenian, will mean that he won't have it easy there. He goes into detail, but the basics is just this acknowledgement that in Athens, citizenship is limited to being born Athenian. And being born Athenian is pretty limited to your father being Athenian. Because Athenians are born of the soil of Athens, and that life as a foreign person in the city isn't easy. It's fraught for many reasons, and with a foreign father, an unknown mother, and born outside of marriage, Ion would have to work very hard to be accepted, and even then would probably be hated by one group or another. He explains all this very clearly. He's just not optimistic about being in Athens. And the same goes for joining the home of Ksuthis' wife. He continues, he will be coming into her home, a woman who can't have her own children, as a child of her husband and someone else. She will resent him. Quote, she will have good reason to hate me when I stand at your side while she still has no child of her own and will look with bitterness on all you love. That, he goes on, will result in either you turning on me and siding with your wife or siding with me and turning your house into chaos. Quote, Think of the bloodbaths and deaths by lethal poison that women have devised for their men. Bloodbaths. Do you get it? Because of the time Clytemnestra killed Agamemnon in the bath? That's a good one. Euripides. He isn't judging Creusa, though. He follows this by saying that he pities her. She is getting older and she doesn't have children. She has such important lineage coming from the line of Athenian founding kings Quote, she does not deserve the curse of barrenness. 
Ion explains that he would be much happier to be a nobody rather than somebody who consorts with criminals and lives in fear of conspiracy against him. He knows that if he were to be brought to Athens and presented as an heir to the throne, he wouldn't be treated as such, that he would be seen as a foreign tyrant wrestling control of the, from Athenians, and, and he'd be hated for it, constantly fearing for his life. Ion is smart and sensible and has a very reasoned grasp on how Athenians see things and what kind of life he would have there. But then he says something that the angry leftist in me loves to hear. Quote, you could say that gold is more than a match for this, and being rich is its own reward. I do not want to hear abuse for hoarding wealth, and I don't want the stress. <sighs> he doesn't want that life. He doesn't want to hoard wealth. He doesn't want to be rich, but feared or hated. He'd much rather live a modest life without the anxiety that would come with this life that Ksuthis would give him. His life, as it's been up to now, hasn't been bad. He lives a life of leisure without fear of violence or really anyone causing him any trouble at all. He serves people seeking access to the god. They are happy and easy. Finally, he makes his point clear to Xuthus. He would rather stay there in Delphi, would rather continue on with the life that he has been leading up to now. It's served him well. Quote, For the pleasure is the same to be happy with a lot, as to find delight in small things. When Ion is finished, the chorus chimes in to essentially agree with him. Quote, That's well said. If only the ones I care for turn up among your successful friends. Xuthus, on the other hand, is going to continue on as he has been. His response is, quote, Stop this talk. Learn to accept good fortune. gods, this play remains relatable, doesn't it? Xuthus isn't interested in the clear, concise, and incredibly evidence-based arguments that Ion has given him. Ion took the time to explain his point well, to be detailed in his reasoning, and to clearly explain his point and why he wishes to remain where he is. He was very clear why he isn't interested in having his life change. And Xuthus just bulldozes right over him. He tells Ion what he should think, how he should feel, how he should be grateful for what he's being given because Xuthus is giving it to him. Once more, Xuthus is attempting to force something on Ion, to force him to be the son that Xuthus wants, one that will carry on in his footsteps, one who will be his literal and figurative heir. He can't fathom that Ion doesn't want what he wants, power and wealth and control. He can't fathom that Ion isn't interested in the benefits of being a man under the Athenian patriarchy. You cannot convince me that Xuthus isn't a stand-in for the patriarchy of ancient Athens, a patriarchy that laid the groundwork for the same one we live in now. Nor that this patriarchy isn't tightly bound up with capitalism, an obsession with wealth and appearances over a comfortable, simple life among people you love. Xuthus tells Ion that he wants to have a big party, a feast in honor of Ion, where they will make prayers and sacrifices that were neglected at his birth, and that it should take place in Delphi, in the same place where Xuthus found him. Then he says... They'll return to Athens, he says. Ion will return there, quote, as a sightseer, not as my son. This is a twist. Xuthus concedes that it would hurt Creusa to bring Ion back as his son, and he doesn't want to hurt her. So they'll keep it a secret, and in time he will convince Creusa to allow Ion to be the heir, to rule over Athens. And here at, like, line 660 of this play, Xuthus announces the name that he will give the boy. Like, up till now, Ion didn't have a name. Hermes called him Ion in the prologue, but he said the name was still to come, so here it is. Xuthus says he'll call him Ion because it was Ion he saw as he was leaving the temple. There are ancient Greek etymological reasons for this and why it works, but I'm not going to try to explain them. And once more, he makes clear that he isn't giving Ion a choice in this. He, he finishes response, his response to Ion's request for his life not to change by telling him to go get all his friends and they'll have a feast for him to say goodbye. 
And then for good measure, he tells the chorus of women to keep it secret or he will kill them. A pointed contrast to the same plea that Creusa made of Ion, keep it secret that she was there in Delphi seeking news of this lost baby. But Creusa asked nightly, nicely. She appealed to Ion's kindness to keep her secret. Xuthus can't imagine such a thing. He's only got threats of violence on his side. To which Ion only responds with one thing. His life isn't worth living unless he finds his mother. And he prays now that she is from Athens. Quote, so I'll have freedom of speech on mother's side. Because again, you cannot convince me that Ksuthis isn't a stand-in for the patriarchal structure of Euripides' world, and ours for that matter. Or that Creusa, now through her son Ion, isn't a stand-in for an alternative world where affection and family is more important than wealth and power. Where people, people, are more important than wealth and power. Western patriarchy spawns violence if the world is structured based on who has the most control over others and how that control is gained and held by violence, then the world is structured around violence, particularly against those less powerful. The chorus sings of Creusa's grief. Quote, I see tears and grieving and a deluge of lamentation when my queen learns that her husband is blessed with a son, but she is left barren and without children. They sing to Apollo. They ask him where this came from. Quote, what song did you unravel? They ask where Ion came from, who is his mother. They question the oracle, saying they can't be flattered into thinking that the oracle is not capable of deceit. They're afraid of what will happen, they're confused by the gods' actions and what will happen to their home as a result. They sing of Xuthis, how he came into their home as a stranger, a foreigner, falling into wealth when he married Creusa, and now bringing a stranger into their home, one who will only bring her grief. They basically curse Ksuthis, hoping that his prayers to the gods won't reach him. They see what is to come, that Ksuthis and Ion would be doing terrible things, that they're already close. They sing to Dionysus and his maenads, to the mountain Parnassus, where they are now, but which they say will have his bacchants roaming at night. They ask that Ion not reach Athens, that he die before he can reach the city. They've had enough foreigners there. The xenophobia is real. Let's not ignore that. It's very Athenian. Finally, Creusa returns to the stage, and she's not alone. With her is an old man who used to care for her father, Athens' former king, Erechtheus. He's there as her friend, a, a kind of father figure himself, someone who's known her all her life. She wants him there to celebrate if the oracle has good news about her future in the hopes that she'll still have a child. We're to assume that he's an enslaved man, though he, again, does have very clear and strong allegiance to Creusa. He sees her as a daughter. We can't ask Euripides for everything. He tells her that the, her desire to keep up the old traditions would make her people proud, and once again we get reminded that she is Athenian people he calls, quote, ancient earth-born folk. This is, of course, in direct contrast to the chorus's song where they sang of foreign inf infiltration into Athens. Creusa is very caring with this old man. She advises him to be careful as he walks, that he should lean on his staff, you know, keep steady when the ground is uneven, take care with his steps. She is once more acting as the character who seeks to love, to mother, to care for others, who looks for affection from those around her, affection that goes both ways. At all turns, Creusa appears in opposition to Xuthus. Where he is brash and forceful, she is calm and caring. She addresses the chorus, quote, 
Women, faithful servants of my loom and shuttle, with what fortune regarding children, the reason we came here, has my husband left the area? Then she asks if they have any news, any information to share with her. But we can't gloss over how she meets them, because once again we are being reminded that these are women. And we're being reminded of the that they are women in the most realistic of ways. These are not women just for the sake of the story. These are not women just fake mythological women. They are women because Euripides is examining what it means to be a woman in Athens. He's intentionally bringing up the very explicit role women played, the things they spent their time doing, what concerned them. As always, he's giving us something close to women's lived experiences. And just like Creusa, the chorus is serving as a force for care and kindness. When Creusa asks if they have any news for her, the chorus leader just exclaims, quote, Oh God! Well, that doesn't sound good, Creusa replies. And the chorus again exclaims, this time of their misery. Creusa asks what's wrong. But they lament because they want to tell her what they've learned, but death is on the line. Xuthus threatened their lives if they were to tell her. So they go back and forth, kind of speaking amongst one another, but really to Creusa, questioning what they should do. It isn't long before they determine that their allegiance, though, is to Creusa. That even if death comes in response, they have to tell her what they know. The chorus tells Creusa, quote, There is no chance for you to hold children in your arms or ever clasp them to your breast. And just as the chorus imagined she would, Creusa grieves. The old man is there to comfort her. He is warm and kind. It's he who questions whether the same prophecy was given to Xuthus or whether she's alone in her fate. At this, the chorus explains what they know. They tell Creusa and the old man of Ion, that Xuthus was told he already has a son and that the boy is nearly a man. It's fortunate that Creusa has the old man there, not only to help her through what she's learned, but because it's him who asks the questions as she handles the shock, the grief. They explain what happened, how Xuthus came out of the palace and the first person he saw was his son. They explain that it was the temple attendant that Creusa met earlier, that it was Ion who was said to be Xuthus' son. And still, as Creusa laments what she's learned, the old man keeps getting more information out of the chorus. The boy is named Ion. They say they don't know who his mother is, that this is all they know, and that now he is gone, that Xuthus has left without Creusa's knowledge and gone to celebrate his new son, to plan a feast and make offerings to the gods in honor of the boy's birth. At this, the old man provides guidance to Creusa. Or rather, he just shit-talks her husband. He speaks of what he thinks must have happened, that Xuthus intentionally fathered a child with someone and had him brought up here in Delphi when he learned that Creusa couldn't have children. He thinks this must have been Xuthus' plan and that, you know, he realized the boy must now be grown, so he convinced Creusa to go there so they could seek the oracle's prophecy. He says that Xuthus intends to seize power through Ion, that he will give rule of Athens to him, that this was always the plan. And I mean... He's only partly wrong. Xuthus is, just as this man suspects, more concerned with power and control than anything else, and absolutely intends to give Athens to Ion. He continues to speculate. He believes that Xuthus must have fathered this child with an enslaved woman. And so he kind of compares it, saying, you know, if Xuthus had done something similar but with a noble woman, you know, that would have been bad enough. Because again, well, as much as this is an indictment of the patriarchy, it is still an Athenian play about how foreigners suck and Athenians rock. It's still about xenophobia because the word basically means fear of strangers in ancient Greek. And it's tragically always existed. And it is not irrelevant that it's this old man, this father figure of Creusa's, who tells her that her only option is, well, he says, quote, 
you must do the womanly thing. Either take up the sword or with some guile or using poisons, you must kill your husband and the boy before death comes to you from them. I can't believe it's a coincidence that Creusa is not the one who decides that murder is the only option she has, that instead it's a man who tells her this. I get accused of a lot of misandry, but honestly, I don't think I've ever been closer to it than I am now as I watch the world burn at the hands of men. It's possible I'm reading deeper into this than I should, but honestly, I don't think so. It's all here on the page. I'm just putting the pieces together. It's the man who suggests murder. He even offers to help. He says that he's willing to go to the feast and kill Ion himself. He's willing to die for it, too, if he has to. To him, it's a matter of right and wrong. And, well, I may not agree that murder is the answer because, Jesus, fuck, if we've learned anything, it's that murdering children is not the answer to any fucking thing. He does finish with another line that reminds me why I'm so obsessed with Euripides. Quote, Only one thing brings shame to slaves. The name. In everything else, a slave is no worse than a free man, provided he is a decent man. (sighs) So if my argument that this play is anti-patriarchy and wasn't strong enough like he's adding in an acknowledgement that enslaved people are just as good and moral as anyone else it's almost like all human beings are just that human and they all deserve the same rights to life and safety whether or not they're from a part of quote-unquote western civilization Creusa is heartbroken she's heartbroken and confused and conflicted how is she meant to go on with this information But more than anything, how is she meant to keep a secret about her own story, her own trauma, her own lost child? This has pushed her over the edge. What is the point of hiding it now? Quote, what is there left to stop me? What prize for virtue am I competing for? Hasn't my husband turned out to be a traitor? She's hidden so long, hidden her trauma from everyone around her for fear that it would change her life, that it would ruin her and shame her. But what is the point now? Once again, we we are not only looking at an assault by a god against a mortal woman, but a god against an Athenian princess, which gives her more credibility than the Athenians in the audience would know what to do with. And here she is talking about the trauma that Apollo inflicted on her, how his assault broke her, and how she hid it with tears. She's finished hiding now. Quote, I will no longer hide the union. By unburdening my chest, my heart will feel lighter. Ah, nerds, thank you all so much for listening. I really can't get over this play. I can't get over just how much Euripides gave a shit. He wrote a play not only looking at the traumas women experienced in his world and the way the culture's mythos so often glamorized sexual assault because half-divine children resulted in it, but he also managed to write a commentary on the terrors of patriarchy and even toss in a bit of commentary on the morality of enslavement. Just a touch... I just want to give him a hug. I want to ask him questions. I just, I feel so much seeing evidence that a man in the ancient world cared, gave a fuck about bad things happening around him. Because as I write this on May 27th, the the day after I and so many other people on the internet saw a video of a man holding up a child that had been decapitated by a bomb that was fired and paid for by quote unquote Western civilization, I just... I just need to know that people cared then and now about horrific injustices that seem so uh, egregious, so horrifying and so obviously morally wrong and yet which continue to be accepted in the world in which we live. They said it was a mistake this morning that they firebombed refugee tents, not only in a UN run area, but that one was four days earlier, explicitly designated as the safe place for innocent families to go. They told them it was the safe place to go four days before dropping a 2,000 pound bomb. They they said it was a mistake, but, but you don't mistakenly firebomb refugee camps. You don't mistakenly behead children with the force of your bombs. You do it on purpose because that's the only way it happens. Bombs are only ever dropped on purpose, and then they lie afterwards because the world saw it. 
And even if it was a fucking accident, then you shouldn't be in control of fucking bombs. And before they said it was a mistake, they said it was a success. And then they realized how many millions of people saw the headless body of a baby being held up by a grieving father. And suddenly they had to say it was a mistake. Western civilization is a joke. We only kill. We only maim. And and we only do it to people who don't fit into what the West has determined is right and good based on our own fucking nonsense. The same West that kills tens of thousands of children purely because they dare to exist on land of their ancestors. And we get to decide what is right and good and what countries are not adhering to that. Fucking monsters. Anyway, I really would love not to bring every episode down in with moments like this but you know unlike the leaders of my country and so many others like I have a heart and a conscience and a soul and I just can't not use this platform I can't just record happy funny things about the ancient world when the this place that ha- ta- has such strong fucking ties to the ancient world is getting I don't know I mean I had to write this after I saw a dead baby so I just I can't not use this platform donate to Gaza call everyone burn the west to the ground it's irredeemable it can't be fixed Let's finish the episode with a five-star review, I guess, because I don't know. That's what I usually do. And like, I, like everyone in the West, I'm expected to continue on embracing capitalist imperialism, even as so many babies die by its hand. I don't know how, how many children my tax dollars killed this year. <sighs> anyway, this uh, review is from a, <laughs> a review. This review is from a user called Etain3 in the States. I hear you. The greatest and most real series of Greek myths and drama discussion and storytelling live is wonderful intellectually adroit and blazingly original do yourself a favor and listen you will not regret it thank you live for all you do feel and speak that's why i read it thank you live for all you do feel and speak solidarity it says let's talk about this baby is written and produced by me live albert michaela smith is the assistant producer laura smith is the production assistant and audio engineer select music in this episode was by luke chaos the podcast is part of the iheart podcast network listen on spotify or wherever you get your podcasts help me continue bringing you the world of greek mythology in the ancient mediterranean by becoming a patron where you'll get bonus episodes and more actually why did i read that don't do that give your money to gaza i'm Liv, and i love this shit